So our speaker today is Alexandra Musser. She just graduated with her master's in consciousness studies from the Holm Institute and the school and school of spiritual leadership. Her focus as new minister is to offer science of mind as the same metaphysical, excuse me, as the same metaphysical philosophy and spiritual psychology that Ernest Holmes intended it to be, not as a religious movement, but as a spiritual approach to positive living where spiritual laws meet and mix with the laws of science to reveal a greater universal truth, where humanity is one with the creative spirit and all of creation. There is power for good in the universe available to all. Life mirrors our very thoughts and expectations. How empowering is it to know that we are the creative authors of our lives? How will we use this power to create a more peaceful, benevolent world for all? Okay, Rev. Alex, take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much. The title of our talk today is Ascending to Higher Heights, because courage is not the absence of fear. And I'm going to start by sharing a opening song from Daniel Neymod. Bring that up. So let's go up, up, up to a higher place. Up, up, up far beyond this time and space. Up, up, up to a higher place. I feel my soul rising to a higher place. Higher place, higher place. I feel my soul rising to a higher place, higher place, higher place, I feel my soul rising to a higher place. No more forward, no more backward, no more spinning around and around. My life is moving ever upward, my feet are Up, up, up to a higher place. Up, up, up far beyond this time and space. Up, up, up to a higher place. I feel my soul rising to a higher place. Higher place, higher place. I feel my soul rising to a higher place. Higher place, higher place, I feel my soul rising to a higher place. No more downward, no more darkness, no more wondering the point of it all. My life is destined, oh for greatness, my soul is answering the call. Beyond this time and space, up, up, up to a higher place. I feel my soul rising to a higher place. Feel my soul rising to a higher place. All right, higher place. So I'm going to start out by telling you a story. And this is a story about a treasure ship from the late 18th century. And it was traveling back to port, laden with all kinds of treasure chests and jewels and gold and things that it had been searching and gathering from the world over. And the captain is on the boat and he's just so pleased with how well the crew has done. But the first mate is just out there taking watch of the horizon, he comes over and he says to him, Captain, sir, there is a pirate ship out on the horizon and they're coming for us. So the pirate, the uh, captain says to the first mate, I want you to go down to my quarters 
and I want you to get me my red shirt and we were ready for battle. So the first mate goes and gets him the red shirt. He puts it on. He just gives all of the people on the boat, all of the crew, just the most incredible, courageous pep talk. And sure enough, the pirate ship comes and they board them and they defeat them all. And everything is great and everybody is celebrating. And so a couple of days later, the first mate is still out there watching the horizon. And he says, Captain, sir. There are now four pirate ships on the horizon and they're gunning for us. And he says, all right then, I want you to go down to my quarters and I want you to get me that red shirt and we're going to go to battle and they're not going to be able to take advantage of all the things that we worked so hard to gather to take back to our kingdom. So the first mate brings him the red shirt. He puts it on. He just gives the crew just the most incredible pep talk again. And sure enough, the four pirate ships come and they board them. This time it's not so easy. They have some casualties, but they're able to just defeat the pirates. The pirates are all thrown overboard and all is good again. And later that night, they have a celebration for what good works they've been able to do to protect this bounty. And the first mate says to the, to the captain, why is it that you always ask for your red shirt? And he says, well, I believe that we have to lead by example. And if, if the crew sees that I have been wounded and that I am bleeding, they will feel defeated and afraid. And so I wear a red shirt because if anything was to happen to me, they would not see the blood and I could continue to fight fearlessly. And so a couple days later, now just one single day out of port, the first mate says, Captain, there are now eight pirate ships gunning for us and they're coming this way. And the pilot takes a deep, deep breath and he says, very well. Go down to my quarters and get me my brown pants. So the moral of this little joke and this little story is that courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is doing what needs to be done whenever we are called to do it. Winston Churchill said, courage is grace under fire. It is not the absence of fear but it's being able to do what you have to do while you're still afraid. And Martin Luther King told us, I learned that courage is not the absence of fear, but triumph over it. The brave one is not the one who does not feel afraid, but the one who conquers that fear. And so I know that we have been dealing with fearlessness and being courageous and brave this month, but I do, don't want any single one of us to feel that if we still have something within us that is holding us back or giving us little warning signs or anything like that, that there's something wrong with us. We are the true, the beloved of the beloved, and there is no fear in spirit. When we are created in the likeness and image of the divine, to be here to express the creative spirit, it would be completely contrary to any kind of logic, any kind of divine mind or divine intelligence to set things in opposition to itself. And if we know that all there is is God, then what could oppose us, you see? But yet we are here to be spirit having a human experience. And the human experience is new to us. And so it creates all kinds of obstacles. They begin for us in childhood. Fear of failure, fear of rejection, fear of change. Fear of public speaking is huge. I teach public speaking online among other things. The fear of the unknown, even the fear of success even the fear of success. Because you see, in our families, in our communities, in many areas, in our work, there's a lot of people that will say, no, you can't do that. What's wrong with you that you're even thinking that? 
to share a little story with you about crabs. When you gather crabs on the beach and you put them in the bucket, they're perfectly able to crawl out of the bucket. But what happens is as they start to crawl up, the other ones pull them back down. And so this is where our beloved community comes in. This is where groups like this, like-minded people, will be able to support you. These are the groups and the centers and those that are here to tell you, yes, yes, you can do this. We want to be careful that we don't share what our goals, our aspirations, and our hopes are with people that would not be willing to support us. You know, my brother-in-law, when I semi-retired from 35 years as a real estate and mortgage broker, and I told him that I was pursuing my master, said, as if that's going to do you a lot of good now. There are those people. He's not Mel Boland. He likes me. He just thinks in terms of, well, your career's over, so why do you need more knowledge? But the thing is that as long as we are the beloved of the beloveds, we continue to learn, we continue to unfold, and we continue to grow. And as long as there's something within us that's tugging at our hearts to go and be and do something, that is the voice of God. And we have to be able to trust that, to know that we are able to move forward and that we can accomplish those things despite the fears. Most of the fears that we have come from our youth. Fear of not being good enough. Fear of getting into trouble for being our authentic selves. Fear for having been laid over some kind of a mold and we realize in our heart of hearts that we just don't fit, okay? Mine started with that my family wanted a boy and I was born a girl. And I was, the reason my name is Alexandra is because I'm named after my dad. I was raised in Romania with the story from ever since I can remember that my mother rejected me in the hospital for three days until my grandmother was going to raise me. And then my mother didn't want to give me up to my grandmother. There was my first initial thing that I just couldn't do. I mean, I wasn't good enough for them, but there was nothing I can do. I think of people in the LGBTQ community. I have a lot of friends in the LGBTQ community that they struggled for years trying to be something that they thought they had to be to fit in, that they felt dirty and soiled because their authentic self was something other than, than that mold that was laid before them. I know that in racial issues where everybody's created equal in the likeness and image of the divine, some people have felt that their doors are closed before them and they're spoken to in certain ways because of the color of their skin. We still see these things happening, happening a lot, to, especially to our African-American young males. I have friends from ministerial school, mothers, and they tell me these stories and how afraid they are. There is nothing they can do to change themselves. And so they might be walking or driving around with this fear. And, but, but it has to be overcome. It has to be overcome in order to be able to show the world that we are one, that we are the oneness and the likeness of the beloved. In speaking about how different minds and different community work, I want to share with you another little story. There were two little teen frogs and their names were Bill and Bob. And Bill was deaf. Now Bill was raised by his parents were practitioners in science of mind. So he was raised with proper attitudes. It was very, very optimistic. So Bill and Bob are walking through the forest, running, going home so they can be home in time for dinner, and they fall into a very deep hole. And so they start to yell and scream and try to get out of there, and nobody can hear them, 
Everybody recognizes that they're not back out of the forest and they go looking for them and they hear them. They hear them in from the bottom of the hole. So they say to them, because they're seeing them jump and try to get out and they can't make it. And they say, wait till the rain comes. You'll be able to swim out. You can't make it. You won't be able to make it. And they just exhaust themselves. And Bob just dies of exhaustion. But Bill, who's deaf, continues to try to jump. And everybody's saying from up above, don't do it. You can't do it. You won't make it. Wait for the rain. And he finally jumps out. And they ask him in sign language, how is it that you were able to do it? And he responds because he can speak. When I saw all of you up there cheering me on, and especially after what happened to Bob, I didn't think that I could let you down because in his mind, they were cheering him on. It's the way in which he was raised. And so no matter what we hear from other people, we have to remember that we are being cheered on. We have the greatest possible cheerleader in the universe. And that is our mother, father, God, who has put us here for the sake of being the best, highest possible version that we can be. I want to share a little bit with you about Neil Donald Walsh, Conversations with God. At the time that he wrote Conversations with God, prior to that, he had been a radio show director, but he had just gotten a divorce. He had had some spinal surgery that he could not recover from, and he had lost his job, and he had his house burned down, and he was literally living in his car. And he started the conversations with God for his own sake, asking, how can this happen? How can this happen to me? And he started to receive answers. And the answers, he believes, came from his higher self. And of course, we know by now he's written 38 books. He's remarried. He lives in Ashland, Oregon. He gives workshops. He's tremendously successful because no matter what the circumstances were, he looked up instead of down. He could have just as well have felt defeated. He could have just as well felt that what was happening in his life was a, res a result of the enemy, such as in the book of Job, but he didn't. And he rebuilt his life from the bottom up but what's even more important is the gifts, the gifts that he left to all of us that we can do the same thing. I was looking, I was researching around online to read a little bit about this. And I don't know how many of you ever look up Quora, but it comes up once in a while. And somebody wrote in there, I don't know why God would speak to D Neil Donald Walsh, but not to me. Well, God speaks to everybody. The difference between Neil and whoever made this comment is that he was willing to listen. He was open at the top, as our science of mind symbol shows, and he was willing to listen. And if you're not listening, then no one is speaking to you. Ernest Holmes in Science of Mind, page 52, writes, the law works for us by flowing through us. If we believe it will work, it works by appearing to work. And if we believe it will not work, it works the same as if appearing not to work. A belief in two, its faith is misplaced when there is a belief in two powers rather than in one. And then he talks about the power of treatment, which is affirmative prayer, which is where again, the beloved community comes in. Not only can we do treatment for one another, but as trained practitioners and ministers, we are trained to see the truth in the face of false evidence, fear. After all, what is, what's the anachronism for it? 
um, false evidence of things appearing real. And so when we summon forth the treatment through treatment, the power of truth, the power of divinity, the power of perfect health, and the power of divine ideas, then the truth of the individual awakens and blossoms into that despite the false appearances. We are vibrational beings. And so it is our job as little godlings, as children of the divine, to be able to continue to raise our vibration to the divine and a true essence. It is not going to lower its vibration to come looking for us and for helping us. And so I think the person, Cora, that said, why isn't God speaking to me? Kind of had an idea like that in mind where in fact, we have to raise our vibration. It is not easy work to do. We live in a three-dimensional, pretty slow moving world. And so be, to even be having these kinds of conversations with like-minded people, I'm sure that there's others that would just listen to all of us and hear us here. And we would think, they would think that, you know, that we're Fruit Loops in some way, but we have to remember that we're not that we are, we are the seed of the divine. We are the first forward step of each and every single day. And so as vibrational beings, we continue to level up. We continue to deny the negativity. We continue to deny the false evidence of things appearing real. And by doing this, by the way, we activate something in our brain called the reticular activating system, which is in our brain stem. And what that does, it's a, it's a regulatory um, part of our brain that once it believes, once it, it, it gets notion that we believe something, it then goes out and finds things in support of that belief. Synchron what we've learned to call synchronicities. You know, once it says, hey, she really, really, really wants to connect with another center for spiritual living. I'll encounter somebody at the supermarket in line that's from that center. And we go, gosh, how did that happen? Well, it's the same system that when you decide that you want to buy a red Jeep and you're driving out in traffic, the only thing you're able to see are red jeeps. So for those that say, well, we can't continue to affirm things that are not true. They are true to us. They are true in our mind. Everything begins with a thought and we are wired. When we, when we talked earlier, when thank you so much, by the way, for that wonderful introduction, Catherine, about science and divinity being the same. The, a coin has heads and tails. If we are divine beings, then our physiology, our scientific biology is in divine alignment. We are equipped with innate physical tools that will help us achieve those things that we believe. And unfortunately, when we believe the negative, since there is no negative, there is no, no in God, then we know that that's going to come about. As an example, I have a tenant, my husband and I have a tenant, a lovely person in one of our rentals, but she's very fearful. She's had a very difficult life and just more things go wrong with that unit than with any other property that we have. And there's nothing really wrong with it. It's just, she is conditioned to have things go wrong. And then I just feel the anxiety in her voice when she calls me and she's apolog apologetic because in her upbringing and she shared some of that with me when something went, went wrong, she was always to blame and she was always in trouble, even if it was her fault or not. And I have to reassure her, but this continues to replay itself. Can you see how, how that works for her? It works for all of us in that same way. We have to understand that things are embedded in our consciousness and we can change them. So 
In closing, before we go to our final song and our questions and answer and meditation, I want to leave you with a quote from Meister Eckhart. The eye in which I see God is the eye in which God sees me. There is only one. And so my advice to you, my parting words are, watch what you look at and how you perceive it, because it will be mirrored in your life. Namaste. And so now in closing, uh, before we go to the meditation, I have a wonderful song that I have selected from Michael Gott. I hear I used to be in Reno, Reno Center for Spiritual Living when Michael Gott was there. Oh my God, I am such a fan. the progress that you make the reason you live is there in every gift you give love your life love your dreams you will do amazing things Uh -oh. hmm. I'm sorry. Oh, Can you hear me? It's not working. I'm sorry that wasn't coming across that well. No, it's not. That's too bad. I like I do like that song very much. I do too. We'll go. I'll stop it. All righty. So I would like to open it up for conversation. We will have our closing prayer at the very end. And I have some questions to ask you about, maybe you can jot this down if you have some paper and pencil, and then we can talk about it. What would you consider the top five areas of your life, the five most important areas of your life? Okay, okay ready for conversation, everyone? Um, before we start, I'm, I am going to stop the recording for the conversation so that we can, you know, be more open about, about what we talk about. Right. Um, before we, before I stop the recording, I do want to say thank you so much, Rev. Alex. That was lovely. Um, you said so many things I, I, that I wrote down that I want to talk about. Um, before I do stop the recording, I do want to say that here at Centers for Spiritual Living, we do believe that one gives where one receives spiritual food. Um, and if you found anything of value in this talk, in this discussion, uh, would you contribute to our work? If you want to contribute to our work, if you feel moved to make a donation, 
please go to our website, which I'll put in the chat. And there it is, make a donation. So I'm now stopping the recording. There we go. Hello?